Hello and welcome to another Sales Expert Insight interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop Online Sales Magazine and Pipeliner CRM. And today I am joined by Andy Wooten, who is in the DC metro area. Hello, Andy. Hi, John. Good. And Andy is the managing principal of Contrary Domino and an expert in revenue risk. And that's really what we want to talk to today about, uh, how companies can identify and, and assess and manage revenue risk. So, Andy, let's let's get going immediately and talk about what do sure. you mean? What do you mean when you talk about revenue risk? Well, I look at it like an exploration problem, not unlike any kind of natural resource like coal or oil. We're out looking for revenue, and associated with that is uncertainty. And uh, the risk is just one level below uncertainty. So the risk is the quantification of uncertainty. So uncertainty really represents just the major issues. Are we going to make our number? And then the risk is more finite and it's associated with the identification of what those issues are and then below that the quantification of the ranges so we will we'll be getting into that shortly yeah so a lot of organizations let's face it you know say it's very dynamic uh, very dynamic process um, is that people tend to look back later, right, reactively and sort of say, okay, we missed our revenue, what happened? Um, you're talking more about proactive risk management, correct? That's that's correct. Uh, throughout my sales upbringing, uh, it always was, uh, this would be fam familiar to many people, uh, you look at the sales chart and you say, oh my gosh, what was that, that bus that hit us in the second quarter or third mm -hmm. quarter? Uh, the risk management that uh, that I'm talking about is really looking at the road ahead and seeing where the potholes are, or at least trying to understand where they might be, and then reacting or responding uh, accordingly. So what's the, what, what is the process of doing that, and what should you be looking out for? Well, uh, the first thing is to recognize that risk can come from many places. A lot of people tend to look at it uh, as an internal issue and say, well, our risk comes from the fact that we – don't know what our marketing messages uh, are, or what the optimum messages are. We don't uh, know clearly what our target markets are. Um, we still haven't figured out our sales hiring criteria and what makes the most competent salespeople. But the first part of this uh, challenge is to look at it holistically and recognize that risk can come from uh, not just the, the internal part, but, of course, the external co competitors or competition, which most people already know, uh, there's also economic risk, there is technological risk, there is uh, risk from uh, world events, and all of these have an impact on whether or not we make our number right, right here at our own companies. So what are some of the steps you can take to mitigate risk, or can you? No, you, <clears throat> there are certain risks that um, companies really need to understand that they, they have to accept. So I'll, I'll start there. And that risk is that a customer may not buy. So it may sound facetious and say, oh, well, of course, you know, we, we understand that's a risk. Uh, but many companies go in with uh, so thinly resourced and they say, we literally cannot afford to lose a deal or we're out of business. Mm -hmm. So that is a, a very high order problem. I think any any company in the at least in the commercial world has to be able to accept the risk that a given opportunity may not close. So you have to first uh, determine which risk that you can accept, and then you uh, look at the the other risks and say, well, which ones do we need to uh, mitigate? As you, as you pointed out, and there's a number of ways to do that. There's uh, you can reduce the risks. You can eliminate them. You can share them with with others, which is uh, a lot of what a channel strategy mm -hmm. is, uh, is is for is, is to share risks with your with your channel partners. And you can transfer them. And there's there's uh, other stakeholders who are there uh, who are can be involved in that as well. Customers, you can share your risks with customers. You can share your risk with the sales force. Uh, you can share them with uh, with investors. So. Uh, those are some different strategies for mitigating them, and exactly which is the right one is something that uh, that needs to be explored. 
Yeah, so can you give me some examples from the companies that you've worked with, maybe some practical examples of where companies have become good at um, handling risk and assessing risk with their revenue? Oh, sure. Uh, so uh, I had mentioned the channel strategy earlier. So many companies will take uh, channel partners, and uh, if you're a manufacturer, for example, you may share your risk with your channel partner by having them hold your inventory uh, so you can sell them or you can sell your products uh, mid-tier and then have your your channel partner add value or add products around them. Uh, that's a risk sharing strategy or um, you can uh, uh, you can do co-marketing, co-branding. Uh, those are uh, uh, again risk sharing strategies but with any of these efforts, you have to make sure there's an upside as, as well. So risk mitigation doesn't work, at least with risk sharing, it doesn't work unless there's an upside for the uh, channel partner or for whoever you're sharing the risk with. Right. Um, what, what are some other, um, so if you're, if you're just selling maybe direct to business, right, you don't have a channel strategy, what are some of the um, tactics that you've seen work well for uh, handling risk in in so a lot of people listening in are probably just selling their product or service direct to market. Sure, sure. Yeah, a very common example, although people may not think of it as is a risk sharing, is it is a try and buy. Mm. So companies do that frequently as a way to entice a, a customer to to take a product or to uh, test it out, and so a money back guarantee is is basically a risk sharing strategy. So if I'm offering a money back guarantee, I'm betting that my customer is going to be happy with the, the performance and the uh, function of my product, and my customer is uh, is paying me for the product, but they also have the understanding that if they're dissatisfied with it for any reason within a certain period of time, they can return it. So that's a very common example of a uh, of a risk sharing strategy that a company may may have with a customer. So how do you um, how do you then? Okay, so one thing identifying risks it's uh, and, and mitigating them to some degree, um, but how then do you are you able to come up with good solid revenue forecasting when there's all of these different kind of variables that come into play? Yeah, that's a great uh, it, it's, it's, that's a great question, and uh, the way that I do that is. To look at uh, start at the very top and to look at a uh, company's uh, quota or revenue goal for the year. So, uh, to pick out a nice round number, say it's ten million dollars, mm -hmm. and to really confront that number and to think about it not just in the Pollyanna or most optimistic way and say, well, of course we're going to make that number because we're all winners here. Mm -hmm. uh, we have to really look at it and say, well. If our assumptions don't play out and if some bad things happen that could happen, what's the worst case scenario? And so then you look at, you, you make that examination and you say, you know what, if we can fog a mirror, we're going to be able to make $4 million. I'll just right. mm -hmm. we'll pull a number out of the air. We'll make, we'll make $4, four million. Uh, and if things are really clicking on all cylinders and our new markets open up as we expect and our sales team is uh, is really highly motivated and they're doing well, uh, then we, we could do $18 million. So that's a – if you're the CFO, that's a pretty volatile range, $4 yeah. to $18 million. So the next part of that exercise is saying, well, what – at least on the top end – I'm sorry, on the bottom end, what could uh, close that – that gap somewhat. What are the wh what is what is bringing that number down to four million dollars? And you say, well, if the economy doesn't play out, if our new release isn't ready in the third quarter, um, if our pricing strategy that we're testing out if it if it doesn't work, um, then we have uh, we're we're probably going to be closer to that that four million number. But if it, if they do work out, if things do work out, if our assumptions come true that we're expecting, then we could close that gap uh, and make it, uh, it would be closer to $8 million. So you look at what those top variables are that are impacting that low end of the number and say, all right, what do we need to do to mitigate those, those risks? And there are some very real things that can be done. This is really a, a sure. whiteboard exercise. Mm -hmm. 
And uh, then you can actually model this statistically, and you can look at uh, which of these variables will have the greatest impact on that low end of the range. So that's called worst case, most likely, and best case. Right. But the key to that exercise is you have to be willing to accept that and confront that and not be so deterministic and say, I don't want to hear how we're not going to make our number. I want to hear how we are, because if that's the case, then you can't really tackle the big issues that, that may be putting downward pressure on your, uh, on your potential revenue. Is there a danger, though, that you could uh, go too far with uh, you know, risk assessment and, so, and that you could end up maybe um, putting in a target that's not a stretch for people, that maybe is a comfortable one, that maybe has people um, not, not firing on all cylinders? Is there a danger that you become you know, too risk-averse, if you like? Oh, I, I think that that does happen. Uh, companies are, are worried that they, they want to stay right in the middle of the bell curve. Uh, they're often rewarded for hitting the number that they, that they predict, so they ratchet back what they, what they think they can uh, do so that they, they get their bonus. And many companies, actually, uh, many executives don't realize the gaming that, that goes on with that. So um, I think that's a... Um, that's something that can be addressed with incentives and making it so that the upside potential is, is high enough that uh, people are incented to stretch and achieve a stretch goal, uh, but at the same time, they're, they're not overly penalized for missing it. Um, so that, uh, th that's part of it. And the other part is really how a company thinks of itself uh, or thinks it uh, uh, works with its strategic risk. And that is every company to succeed must be able to accept risk. And they're set up for different risk, what I call risk capacity. Mm -hmm. So they may have the capitalization to say, well, we can sustain a, a, a 12 month or 16 month sales cycle, whereas other companies can't. Right. So they have to look at that and say, well, we can use that risk to our advantage because we have a run rate of, we have cash flow coming in. We can carry sales opportunities a, uh, a bit longer than our competitors, and so that becomes a competitive strength instead of a, a liability. So you have to really make sure that the risks that you take on as a company match your, your capacity. So using that example, uh, there's many companies that don't have that understanding, and they'll take these horrendously long and difficult sales engagements, right. and then they realize they're, they're two years into it, they haven't made a dime, mm -hmm. and they're out of gas. They have no more. They have no cash flow. They can't sustain it. They have no funding, and that this this happens every day. Well, to, that's actually a mismatch of their the risk they take on to the risk capacity that they have. Yeah, and that's an interesting uh, example that you give there because it means that there needs to be obviously good coordination and cooperation between sales and the rest of the financial management or the other parts of the company because as you say um, you know you could get into a type of sale you could set sales targets that really don't uh, and don't match with your capacity to deliver or your cash flow right to sustain during that period so it does need to be a holistic approach correct that's exactly right. I, I strongly encourage CFOs to sit in on the sales meeting where they discuss their opportunities and also, and in particular, their, um, their qualification uh, tactics. How do they qualify opportunities? I, I think the, the scary thing is for many CFOs is they'd be appalled if they knew how uh, accounts were coming into the pipeline and what the sales force was carrying because they're going on one assumption that, that – uh, they're going to be hitting their numbers every month, and then if they looked at it, they'd say, wow, the sales force is really taking on a lot of very speculative deals here, mm -hmm. and we are not going to be able to meet our, our cash flow needs if these don't pan out. So there really needs to be a meeting of the minds to make sure that sales is taking on a portfolio of, of opportunity, not just the, the riskless, there, there's, there's very uh, low risk opportunities, sure. but the right mix of low, medium, and high risk to make sure that they're not putting the company in jeopardy. 
And and to do that, then, um, you know, one final point, I think, to do that, then, it obviously means that you need to understand your customers. You need to understand the sales cycles of, of various types of customers. And you need to constantly be looking at, and looking at that and assessing that, because otherwise, as you say, you could get into opportunities that take months and months, you know, a year to close, and you weren't expecting that. Oh, absolutely. I, I think a lot of sales managers and salespeople get um, jaded by the numbers, and so they'll see an opportunity that's really high value, uh, but carries a great deal of risk, and yet the sales manager will say to the rep, oh, you've got to go after that. That's That one, you, you, you could make your entire number for the year if this account closes, but it may be a poor fit for the company's product and service, it may be a highly competitive deal, it may be one where there's a strong incumbent, and then you start to look at the, the elements that are exerting pressure or, or risk pressure in there, and you say, well, there's a low probability that this is going to close, and yet many uh, sales reps and, and sales managers tend to put all their chips on one, uh, play all their chips in one square, and that's that's a problem. Yeah. Yeah, put it on red or black and one big spin, and hopefully it all comes true. <laughs> and they hope it, yeah, and they hope it comes true, and and it doesn't. Meanwhile, as I said, the CFOs back there looking at a at a number that sales is forecasting and say, well, you know, we we uh, have eight million in the pipeline, and that's uh, that's what we need, so everything must be good. And they don't realize that the opportunities that are that make up that eight million dollar forecast are highly speculative. All right, well, Andy, we're bumping up against the end of our time here. Before we go, I just want you to tell people a little bit more about yourself, what you do, your company, and how they can find out more about you. Oh, sure. Thanks, John. Uh, sales, um, my company, uh, Contrary Domino, is a sales strategy consulting firm. We work with B2B companies that have a revenue challenge that is a broad charter, so I usually start with a gap and uh, help companies figure out what are the risks that are contributing to that gap and then help them solve that problem. So that could be a uh, quota to, to uh, actual gap, it could be a sales force churn, it could be customer churn, and we look at the elements that uh, may contribute to that and help them improve. Great. Listen, Andy, thanks. Thanks for talking to us about risk today. Uh, Andy Rudin, Country Domino. Uh, my name is John Golden, Sales Pop Online Sales Magazine and Pipeliner CRM, and see you all for another expert interview real soon. Thank you. Thanks, John. It's been a pleasure. Okay, bye, Andy. Bye. So I encourage you to subscribe to salespop.net, the online sales magazine. Also subscribe to our YouTube channel, and then comment. Get involved in the conversation. Love to hear what you have to say.